Good evening and welcome to NTD News. I'm Stephanie Cox. Here are today's top stories. The Supreme Court dishes out the last of its momentous decisions this session. One of them says the federal government went too far and the ruling has some environmentalists up in arms. Another key decision by the High Court today has some fearing that it could make the border crisis worse. We bring you more on the fate of the Trump era's Remain in Mexico policy. We hear from U.S. Representative Kat Kamak on the Biden administration's proposed changes to Title IX. Should these legal protections include gender identity? And what will happen to women's sports if they do? Disney and yet another controversy over LGBT content. This time it's about a character on the new Baymax animated series. Today at the International Religious Freedom Summit in D.C., a group exposes China's hidden crime of forced organ harvesting. Many of the victims are practitioners of the Falun Dafa spiritual practice. We hear their stories. Pac-12 powers UCLA and USC are reportedly on the move as realignment continues to reshape the college landscape. Find out which conference poached the coveted schools. In a new ruling today, the Supreme Court has cut back the Environmental Protection Agency's power. The court says the EPA cannot nationally regulate CO2 emissions. Not, at least, without Congress. Earlier today, I spoke with Michael O'Neill, Assistant General Counsel at the Landmark Legal Foundation, to learn more. Michael, thank you so much for joining us. My pleasure. The Supreme Court has made a huge decision today. Uh, based on a decision around the EPA and whether it can issue a regulation that would right. essentially transform the way that uh, energy is generated in the U.S. What would this mean for consumers and businesses in the U.S.? Well, if the EPA had had its way and the Biden administration had had its way, they would have imposed what is known as the Clean Power Plan upon our country. And the Clean Power Plan sought to radically transform how our nation generates electricity. It would have forced traditional power power plants such as natural gas and coal generating power plants out of business. It would have imposed hundreds of billions of dollars upon the economy, increased the cost of electricity in some states by 25 percent, and resulted in tens of thousands of jobs being lost. By any stretch of the imagination, this regulatory action amounted what amounted to what was known as a major rule. And the court today constrained administrative agencies by, in, by instituting what is known as the major questions doctrine and said that and essentially what the court stated was, if an administrative agency like the Environmental Protection Agency is going to promulgate a regulatory action or a rule of such huge magnitude, and again, we're talking hundreds of billions of dollars, tens of thousands of jobs lost, driving energy, radically transforming how our nation generates electricity, an agency has to have a clear authorization from Congress to do this. And in this case, there's just no clear authorization. Proponents of the of the uh, of the rule would say that the EPA had authority under the Clean Air Act to do this. Well, EPA relied on a very obscure provision of the Clean Air Act that was never intended, never drafted to to enable or empower the EPA to take this sort of massive regulatory action. So essentially, this is a win for the rule of law. This is a win for American consumers, and this is a win for our Constitution. The dissenting justices have expressed concern that this decision will limit the EPA's ability to respond to natural disasters. What do you make of that? Absolutely not. This simply says that if you are going to impose massive regulatory costs, you have to have authorization from Congress. In the context of natural disasters, there's emergency provisions that the president has at his disposal to address those. This is a for, this, is, this regulatory action would have changed how we generate power going forward. Again, I'm not saying that our country should or should not move to renewables or to renewables such as winds or solar. All that has to be done, though, is Congress has to authorize the agencies to do this. Congress has to speak. Congress can no longer abrogate its duty to enact laws. Now it's incumbent upon Congress to take action. And again, this is how our framers intended this. They always envisioned the Constitution states as clear as clear as day that all all legislative power, in other words, lawmaking power, is vested with Congress, not with these unaccountable bureaucrats at the Environmental Protection Agency.
And you've said before that this case is really about whether the EPA was violating the Constitution. Sure. Do you think other federal agencies are, you know, overreaching? Oh, absolutely. I mean, that's been that's been one of the one of the one of the items that conservative legal movements have tried to address. Look, separation of powers is imperative to preserve liberty. You cannot have unaccountable, unaccountable bureaucrats in Washington, D.C., dictating national policy when the people of the United States have not spoken. Congress needs to authorize these agencies to take action, and agencies need to operate with modesty and only operate within the statutory delegations that they have been provided from the Congress of the United States and through the lawmaking process. So do you think having a congressional delegation on these huge issues and major decisions is all that's needed to redress the balance of power here? Well, it would, it would help. Again, environmentalists, environmentalists ca characterize global warming, climate change as catastrophic. If it is catastrophic, then it's incumbent upon the people's representative body, Congress, to speak accordingly. In the absence of Congress speaking, then agencies cannot seize power that they don't have. And so what's the issue at heart here? The issue for, well, the issue, there's a couple. Number one, the American people have been saved, even increased, increased costs in their electric bill. We're not going to see massive, we're not, well, inflation's already adding to everybody's costs of their electric bill. Gasoline's in, it has, gasoline, as we all know, has increased dramatically. The EPA is not going to be able to impose additional costs. So in the short term, that's what we see. From a bigger picture, we see a re-entrenchment of, of a respect for the rule of law and for the separation of powers. Again, administrative agencies going forward cannot take these massive, impose these massive regulatory actions upon the American people without express delegations from Congress. And finally, what other changes do you expect this decision to affect going forward? Oh, right. That's a fantastic question. I see this reverberating throughout the administrative. Interestingly enough, President Obama, when he didn't get his way through Congress, resorted to regulatory actions to kind of ram his agenda through. Now presidents, executives, are going to have to be respectful of the rule of law and not, all, and not count on their administrative agencies to get their policies enacted. You have to seek consensus in Congress. Congress has to authorize the action before the administrative agencies can take, the, can take action. Michael O'Neill from the Landmark Legal Foundation, thank you so much for your time. My pleasure. You have a great day. And another landmark ruling on the final day of this closely watched Supreme Court term, marking a win for President Biden's immigration policy. Another historic day at the Supreme Court with two key rulings. In a 6-3 to three vote, the High Court ruled Thursday that the Environmental Protection Agency does not have the broad authority to try to overhaul the nation's energy policy by pressuring industries to shift away from fossil fuels. Instead, the court says Congress should have the say. But another ruling on Thursday marks a win for the Biden administration. The high court gave the president a green light to end the Remain in Mexico policy that began during the Trump era. While in effect, the policy sent some 70,000 illegal immigrants who entered the U.S. back to Mexico instead of detaining them or releasing them into the U.S. We're very happy to see the ruling on the Remain in Mexico policy um, this policy has been a humanitarian disaster. Kate Godel, legal director of litigation at the American Immigration Council, tells us that the decision will allow more lawful processing of migrants. But Texas Attorney General Ken Paxton says the ruling, quote, makes the border crisis worse. And Mark Meckler, the president of Convention of States Action, agrees. We're seeing, we just saw this week, a devastating semi-tractor trailer full of migrants who died because of the summer heat. So I think the most humane policy is to discourage this immigration, to let people apply from home. That's where they should ultimately be applying from. And Thursday marks the last day of this eventful Supreme Court term. Its next session begins on the first Monday in October. And more on the Supreme Court. Today, Judge Ketanji Brown-Jackson becomes the first black woman to be sworn in as a Supreme Court justice, fulfilling a promise made by President Biden. Please raise your right hand and repeat after me. I, Ketanji Brown Jackson, do solemnly swear. I, Ketanji Brown Jackson, do solemnly swear. That I will support and defend the Constitution of the United States against all enemies, foreign and domestic. 
that I will support and defend the Constitution of the United States against all enemies, foreign and domestic. Jackson was confirmed by the Senate in April and sworn in today as Justice Stephen Breyer retires. And staying on the Hill, how fair is women's sports? How about for men who identify as women? Should they compete alongside women? The latest amendments proposed by the Biden administration would include gender identity in Title IX protections. That legal provision was originally designed to minimize discrimination based on sex. But today, some say it could be used to do just the opposite. Among those pushing back against the proposed changes is Congresswoman Kat Kamak, and I spoke with her earlier today. Representative Kat Kamak, welcome to our show. Thanks for having me. Now, the Biden administration wants to expand Title IX protections to include gender identity. If this becomes law, what would it mean for women and girls? Well, as we saw this past week, as we celebrated the 50th anniversary of Title IX, it would just further rob biological women and girls of the titles and podiums and awards that they have worked their entire lives to achieve. You know, Title IX was created to really empower women, biological women. And I stood side by side with women who compete for Team USA, who compete at the highest levels of collegiate athletics, and of course, in high school. And these women are being forced to compete against biological males who have a distinct inherent advantage. And that is just wrong. So if we're going to be upholding uh, Title IX to what it was originally intended to be and preserve girls' sports and really the opportunity for these women to excel in the sport of their choice, we have to protect it as it was originally intended. So I think it's a slap in the face what the administration has done, really trying to cater to the woke mob by including gender identity. So we're going to continue to stand firm and protect girls' sports and Title IX. And some say that these protections or the expanded protections that are proposed are about mm -hmm. fairness. Then on the other side, others say that it will actually lead to the elimination of women's sports altogether. Why do you think that would happen? Well, it's like I said, you know, there is a distinct advantage that a male, a biological male, has when competing against women. And these women didn't sign up for co-ed sports, they signed up to play on a woman's team. And if we're going to be talking about fairness, then start with the science. The science is telling us that these biological males have a distinct advantage in speed and strength and physical structure that allows them to excel beyond what women can. And that's really, like I said, a slap in the face to all these women who have trained, who have prepared, who have competed their entire life. They have sacrificed so much just to really come to the tops of, of their sport. And, and again, this is just eroding women's rights. And Title IX was designed to empower women. And what the administration is doing is going against, one, the science, but also going against women. So that's why I think it's important that people stand up, be vocal about this issue. And I think that there is some sort of middle ground that we can come to when it comes to males who want to compete under a different uh, gender, but they won't be competing against women and biological women. I can tell you that because, like I said, Title IX is about empowering and supporting biological women, and that's what we're going to continue to fight for. And so what could happen in terms of what can Congress do? Because a lot of women feel that their voice isn't being heard in this debate, that essentially it feels like the erasure of women in some way. Well, you know, this is what's interesting. Last week in Washington, D.C., I participated in both a roundtable but also a press conference with Leader McCarthy and some of my colleagues, uh, notably Greg Stubbe from the great state of Florida, one of my Floridian uh, colleagues, but also uh, Debbie Lesko from the great state of Arizona. And she has introduced the Women's Bill of Rights to protect women and particularly Title IX. Representative Stubbe has introduced protecting women's sports uh, legislation. And I think when you talk about what Congress can do legislatively, it's ensuring that these definitions aren't changed to accommodate the whims of a political agenda. And that really is what needs to happen in codifying this legislation. 
So there are steps that we're taking. And I will say this, this is not a partisan issue. This isn't just Republicans leading the charge. I stood alongside Democrat activists at this press conference who fought long and hard for many, many years, um, several of whom were former athletes that um, they are absolutely dismayed with what the administration is doing in changing the core function of Title IX. So this is really getting to an issue that I think all Americans collectively can agree on. And it definitely is a bipartisan issue, and it should remain that. Title IX is about protecting women's sports, and it will continue to exist for another 50 years, but only if we fight together as one. So I'm really proud of the work that's been done legislatively, but we now have the, the tough task ahead of us of actually passing this legislation and getting it to the Senate. Representative Kat Kamak, thank you so much for joining us. Appreciate it. Thanks for having me. And more on transgender news. The Disney Corporation is under fire again for including LGBT content in children's programs. A new Disney show appears to normalize the transgender lifestyle. Here are the details. Investigative journalist Christopher Rufo posted this clip on Twitter Tuesday. The video is from Disney's new show Baymax, which started streaming on Disney Plus this Wednesday, and it's rated PG. Excuse me, which of these products would you recommend? I prefer pads. They're more comfortable for me. Thank you. I always get the ones with wings. In the clip, a male-sounding person wearing a transgender flag can be seen recommending menstrual products to Baymax. Rufo criticized Disney for it, saying the show promotes the transgender flag and the idea that men can have periods to children as young as two years old. It's all part of Disney's plan to re-engineer the discourse around kids and sexuality. The clip has triggered a debate on social media over whether the messaging is appropriate in an animated series for children. Disney has faced recent backlash for actively including LGBT ideologies in its programs. Earlier this year, Rufo publicized footage of an internal company call in which Disney executives discussed the company's not-at-all-secret gay agenda, including a push for more LGBT cartoon characters. NTD reached out to Disney for comment, but didn't hear back before airtime. Reporting by Allison Lee, NTD News. Turning now to religious freedom. In D.C. this week, people around the world have gathered to shed light on religious persecution at the International Religious Freedom Summit. Today, practitioners of Falun Gong, also known as Falun Dafa, shine a spotlight on China's hidden crime of forced organ harvesting. And TD's Melina Weiskop has more. I'm here at the International Religious Freedom Summit in Washington, D.C., and this afternoon there's a strong focus on China's persecution against spiritual believers, which is still happening to this day. So it is still killing people, and my mom is a very good example. She suffered since the very beginning of the persecution for the last 23 years. His mother was killed just a few months ago after being arrested three times and tortured simply for practicing a meditation discipline called Falun Dafa. Practitioners of this ancient spiritual belief follow the principles of truthfulness, compassion, and tolerance. The more people know about this, the less people will suffer. And one young girl, Ming Kui Wong, felt the pressure of the persecution at a very young age. When she was just five years old, she saw her mom at a brainwashing center. Being tied up on a chair with like a thick plastic tube inserted into her nose and she was um, being force fed. That was the first time I ever saw my mother. She was being was used as a pawn in the Chinese Communist Party's agenda to force her mother to give up the practice. It was a way to like break her spirit. But the Chinese Communist Party's brutal persecution has reached unimaginable horror. Many of these prisoners of conscience are victims of live forced organ harvesting. Uh, what, what shocked me the most uh, is the stitches uh, on his throat area. And uh, the incision was uh, all the way down, which clearly indicated that my father's organ had been harvested, likely while he was still alive. Yuhan was 19 years old when her father died. I, I stepped closer to embed in the clothes and uh, uh, after I'm um, opening two buttons and the police immediately stopped me and uh, forced my family out of a facility. 
But they all tell me that despite this torture and the mental scars, they refuse to renounce their faith. We believe in truthfulness, compassion and tolerance. That is not wrong. That is universal principles. And it has made me become a better person. Because of their perseverance and dedication to the practice and telling their stories of meeting face to face with the persecution, the Communist Party was not successful in squashing the Falun Dafa practice. It really turned my life around pretty quickly and it, and um, I was just trying to learn how to be a good person and it, it really did that for me. Their shared message is that this practice is good and it is a crime against humanity to persecute these people for their faith. Reporting in Washington, D.C., Melina Weiskup, NTD News. A horrific persecution. Turning now to the cost of energy. As it rises, so are concerns over the use of fossil fuels. But people still need to eat, heat, and get from A to B. One thinker known for his approach to this dilemma is Bjorn Lomborg, one of Time magazine's 100 most influential people, He's also president of the think tank Copenhagen Consensus Center and was once the director of the Danish government's Environmental Assessment Institute in Copenhagen. Bjorn Lomborg, thank you so much for joining us. My pleasure. Now, energy costs are rising around the world. In the U.S. alone, gas prices are up 50 percent nearly since last year. In your view, how much of this is due to the war in Ukraine and how much of it is due to countries' green energy policies? Oh, that is a very hard question. So it's very clear that energy policies are driving up cost. Uh, but right now, it's probably the majority of the costs that are caused by uh, the, the war in the Ukraine. So the underlying trend upwards is definitely because of climate but, uh, and climate policies. Uh, but the, the incredible increase that we're seeing right now is mostly because of the war. And despite those rising energy costs, Many countries are still forging ahead with their transition to renewable energies. What do you make of that move? Well, so it's important we parse those words. People are saying they're forging ahead, sure, but doing what exactly? Because if you look at what most European and even the U.S., uh, we're seeing a switch towards the old kind of fossil fuels because you actually need reliability in your energy system. Uh, so most people still drive on, on, on gasoline. We still need much coal for our, uh, both for our backbone uh, uh, production of electricity, but also for you know, steel. We need gas for our fertilizer. We need it for so many other things. And so the reality is we're telling ourselves, oh, we're well ahead with the re renewable transition, but we're not really, uh, the world gets about 1.8% of its total energy from solar and wind. And even the rich world gets less than 3%. We talk about this a lot, but we're not actually making much of a transition. So how much do you think the war in Ukraine is impacting countries' ability to reach their climate goals? I think it's more telling us this is going to be a lot harder than you thought it was going to be. So it was always a, 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 a Fata Morgana, a, a, you know, sort of this idea that we were going to be able to transition without any problems. But the war in Ukraine is making it much clearer that we cannot live the life that we've become accustomed to without lots and lots of fossil fuel. Remember, the vast majority of the world gets somewhere between th three quarters and four fifths of its energy from fossil fuels. And we're not likely to see that switch anytime soon. And what we're seeing now is as we suddenly don't have enough uh, energy, for instance, from Russia, we're starting to realize, well, we need it from somewhere else. We can't actually switch that out with solar and wind for the very simple reason that we can't rely on solar and wind when the wind is down or when the sun is not shining, we're screwed. And that's why we need these reliable energy sources. So how do you see this playing out long term? Well, global warming conversation was always a long term conversation. So people are talking about, oh, we'll transition by 2050. Uh, but the reality is 2050 is just around the corner. Most energy policies take, you know, 50 or 100 years to really see large changes. And you're asking people to essentially replace the engine that's the engine of economic growth, was something that we've never tried before. 
Most people are slightly unnerved about that. And of course, especially the world's poor are unnerved by the fact that the rich countries are now saying, look, we all got rich by using fossil fuels and we'll keep using them a lot because we really like the way we live right now. But you guys, you should just go ahead and do solar and wind and all the wonderful stuff and it's going to make you rich no matter what. And of course, they realize that's not actually the truth. So I think what we're seeing here is we are not achieving our goals. It'll be fantastically costly. So, you know, Bank of America, uh, uh, McKinsey, many others talk about cost of five trillion or more per year. Nobody is willing to pay this. And so we need to find a smarter, cheaper and more effective policy. And what do you think that would look like? <laughs> Thank you. I was hoping you'd ask me that. Uh, so fundamentally, we know that we solve problems in the world by innovating, not by telling people thou shall not. We are not going to be able to tell people you can't use a gasoline car or you can't use fossil fuels, especially to the world's poor. But what we can do is innovate the price of green energy down below fossil fuels. If we can do that, everyone will switch. Remember, in Los Angeles in the 1950s, there was lots of pollution, mostly from cars. The solution was not to tell everybody in Los Angeles, you got to walk. That would never work. The solution was the catalytic converter. Put on a little gizmo and you basically emit 99% less pollution. That's what we need for green energy. That's how we're going to solve this problem. That's, of course, how the rest of the world is going to come along as well. Bjorn Longbarg, thank you so much. Thank you. Now to Florida, where the Supreme Court gave permission to Governor Ron DeSantis to make a major move in keeping Florida safe. The governor is now allowed to conduct a statewide investigation on any entities that may be assisting with human trafficking, including local governments. NTD's Jason Perry has the story. But just the sheer number of people, you know, when they're being dumped into different communities, you know, that impacts education, health care, criminal justice, public, all these different things. The Florida Supreme Court approved Florida Governor Ron DeSantis's request for a statewide grand jury to investigate transnational crime organizations that allegedly smuggle people, especially children, across the southern border. I spoke with Jessica Vaughn, who is the Director of Policy Studies at the Center for Immigration Studies. She explained that the statewide investigation will also cover non-government organizations. And sometimes these are smuggling organizations posing as charities. Um, these may be groups that have good intentions, but in fact are enticing illegal settlement into the state of Florida uh, in direct contravention of laws. She also said that the statewide investigation won't stop there, but the local governments could be investigated as well, such as Miami-Dade County or Broward County, which have both issued ID cards for illegal immigrants. Miami-Dade and certain other counties within Florida are looking at becoming sanctuaries again. And so it's important for this grand jury to take a look at what their policies are and determine if they are violating either federal law or state law, and at the very least uh, expose to the public what these policies are so that people can be clear about why Florida may be such an attraction for illegal migration. She went on to say that the state by itself cannot stop illegal immigration, but they can send a signal to criminal organizations that enforcing the law is going to be taken seriously. And if they're going to bring illegal border crossers, they shouldn't bring them to Florida. Jason Perry, NTD News. And if you have any news tips or feedback for the show, you can email us at eveningnews at ntd.com. And coming up, California is on track to become an abortion sanctuary, but the state will not be covering travel costs for women from other states. And Pac-12 powers UCLA and USC are reportedly on the move as realignment continues to reshape the college landscape. NTD's Dave Martin has which conference poached the coveted schools. See China before communism. Behold a splendid culture reborn. Filled with beauty, majesty, and a powerful message of hope. Come see the performance that has touched the hearts of millions. 
live on stage. Get tickets now at ShenYun.com. It's just clear as day. The media, whether it's broadcast, cable, or print media, has become extremely biased. And I started looking online for alternative ways to, to get information. And I saw an ad for a free trial. And I looked at it and I said, Epoch Times? I mean, come on, this is end of days type of stuff? I mean, what are they gonna be talking about here? And I said, well, it's a free trial, let me dig in. Is it giving me both sides? Is it giving me an objective point of view here? I have looked for opportunities to see where they might be biased and I don't find it. It has given me a level of trust in media that I didn't think I'd ever get back. I love the Epic Times because it has renewed uh, my faith in the idea that a reliable, responsible, non-biased source of information is available. And I can say that I love it because of that. Hi, I'm Smokey Bear, and I made an assistant to help you prevent wildfires. Dude, I've got this. I've been camping since I was five years old. But I am a camping influencer. You know what, I'll bet you five bucks. Okay. Assistant Smokey, what is the best way to put out a campfire? Mm -hmm. To put out a campfire, drown with water, stir, drown again, then make sure the fire is out cold by feeling with the back of your hand. Wait, really? I'll take the five bucks. Four men have been charged in connection to the tragedy that left 53 suspected illegal immigrants dead. Two of them are facing life in prison or the death penalty if convicted. NTD's Jeremy Sandberg reports. According to the Department of Justice, 64 people suspected of entering the U.S. illegally were found inside the abandoned tractor trailer in San Antonio, Texas on Monday. 48 of them were dead. The death count is now up to 53 after five of the survivors passed away in the hospital. The driver of the vehicle, 45-year-old Omero Zamorano Jr., was arrested on Wednesday. He is charged with one count of alien smuggling resulting in death for his alleged involvement. Zamorano was identified as the truck's driver after Laredo Sector Border Patrol provided Homeland Security investigations agents with surveillance footage of the truck driving through an immigration checkpoint. The driver could be seen wearing a black shirt with stripes and a hat. Agents confirmed Zamorano matched the individual from the surveillance footage and was wearing the same clothing. Officials say he tried to slip away by pretending to be one of the victims. Another man in communication with him, 28-year-old Christian Martinez, is also in custody. Martinez is charged with one count of conspiracy to transport illegal aliens resulting in death. According to court documents, a search warrant was used to investigate the driver's cell phone. The phone showed the two communicating throughout the smuggling event. Both face life in prison or the death penalty if convicted. Prosecutors say two other men were found at the San Antonio address where the truck was registered. Both are citizens of Mexico and were arrested for firearm-related offenses. The two men were determined to be in the U.S. illegally. They are both charged with one count of possession of a weapon by an alien illegally in the U.S. If convicted, both defendants face up to 10 years in prison. In response to the tragedy, Texas Governor Greg Abbott says state troopers will set up more truck checkpoints on highways. He did not say how many or how many trucks would be stopped, but did say they won't be placed at points of entry. He didn't say where exactly the checkpoints will be in order to surprise the smugglers. Abbott is calling for President Biden to build back Trump's border wall and reinstate other Trump-era border policies. Under President Trump, we saw the fewest illegal crossings in decades. Under President Biden, we see all-time record highs. It's time for President Biden to reinstate the strategies that were put in place by President Trump that proved so effective. Specifically, Abbott mentioned ending catch and release and keeping and enforcing Title 42 and remain in Mexico. Jeremy Sandberg, NTD News. Over to the West Coast, Governor Gavin Newsom is moving forward with his pledge to make California an abortion sanctuary. He has plead, pledged millions in taxpayer money to pay for the process, but not everyone is covered. Let's see who will and will not be covered. And thank you Governor for, Gavin Newsom uh, declined to spend taxpayer uh, dollars to fund people to traveling to California to get an abortion. But California's budget will provide $40 million to pay for abortion procedures if women can't afford them. 
This would include abortion seekers from other states. The budget also includes millions of dollars allocated to abortion clinics. He says the funding would free up clinics' budgets so they could use their own money to help pay for women traveling to California if they so choose. A spokesperson for the governor's office said that Newsom has instead chosen to focus on improving existing abortion services. California is expected to receive a huge influx of women traveling to the state to get an abortion. In a statement, Newsom stated that we have to be realistic about what we can absorb. These decisions come in the wake of a recent Supreme Court ruling that overturned Roe v. Wade. The Supreme Court ruled that it was not the job of the federal government to regulate abortion. Instead, the court returned power to the states to pass their own judgment and laws either in favor or against such practices. Many states, such as Texas, Arizona, and Utah, have already restricted abortion procedures. And more on California, where lawmakers are proposing a new program to help first time home buyers with their down payments. Supporters say it helps with economic security. Opponents think it will raise the cost of buying a house. Here are the details. California Senate President Pro Tem Tony Atkins is proposing to create a billion dollar fund per year for 10 years to help first time home buyers with their down payments. Governor Gavin Newsom already included it in the 2022-23 state budget on June 27th. The program called California Dream for All would help pay 17% of the home price to make home ownership more affordable for first generation homeowners. When the homeowner refinances or sells the home, the share of the home value originally covered by the state should be paid back. Atkins said in May that the California Dream for All program will give more people the chance to break free from the cycle of renting, become the first in their families to own a home, and make it possible for more people to set their children and grandchildren on a path to success. California State Treasurer Fiona Ma and some real estate organizations also support the program. However, some experts believe government funds will make homes more unaffordable in California unless there is enough supply. Jim Righeimer, a real estate developer, told the Epic Times that giving people free down payments for houses would raise the cost of houses. Miosa Diop, an assistant professor of real estate in University of Southern California, agrees with Righeimer adding that the higher demand means higher prices unless there is enough supply. David Lamb, NTD News, California. And now over to sports news. Here's NTD's Dave Martin with today's top stories. Pac-12 powers UCLA and USC are planning to leave their longtime conference for the Big Ten, according to a report by the San Jose Mercury News. The move would give the Big Ten 16 members and allow them to get back on the same level as the SEC as the two most powerful conferences. The defections could happen as early as the 2024 season and seem to be in response to the SEC adding Big 12 powers Texas and Oklahoma last summer. The move would make little geographical sense though as the closest Big Ten campus to either USC or UCLA is the University of Nebraska in Lincoln, more than 1,200 miles from Los Angeles. But the allure of adding the West Coast television market into upcoming TV negotiations with a conference that already has footprints in Chicago and New York City would surely be enough to make it happen. At the same time, the move would seem to dampen the relationship between the three conference alliance that was formed last summer between the Big Ten, ACC, and Pac-12. The alliance was formed in response to the SEC's move and was thought to be an alternative to conference expansion. In NBA news, former MVP and four-time scoring champion Kevin Durant is requesting a trade from the Nets, according to a report by ESPN. Durant first came to Brooklyn in a sign-and-trade deal with the Golden State Warriors in 2019, but missed his first season with a torn Achilles. This past year, he played in 55 games for Brooklyn and averaged just under 30 points per game. The Nets, which at one time had superstars Durant, Kyrie Irving, and James Harden, were unable to advance to the finals with injuries as well as Irving's vaccination ban and then Harden's trade request, keeping the trio from reaching their full potential. In baseball news, two-way star Shohei Otani struck out 11 batters last night in five and two-thirds shutout innings to extend his scoreless streak, 
to a career best 21 and two thirds innings. Last night's start marked his third straight scoreless outing in which he struck out 10 or more batters, becoming just the ninth pitcher this century to do so. The two-way star is now fifth in the league in strikeouts, while offensively he ranks in the top 10 in home runs, RBIs, and runs scored. Elsewhere in the league, the New York Yankees hit a pair of home runs yesterday in their 5-3 win over the Oakland A's. The blast not only powered New York to a series sweep, it also gave them 57 home runs for the month, setting a new June record. At 56-20, the Yankees have far and away the best record in the game. At Wimbledon, number one ranked women's tennis star Iga Swiatek advanced with a three-set win over Leslie Patinama Kirkov to run her winning streak 37 matches in a row. The victory advances her to the third round and gives her the longest streak on the women's side since Martina Hingis also won 37 in a row in 1997. On the men's side, two-time Wimbledon champion Andy Murray lost to American John Isner in four sets. The win for Isner was his first in nine career matches against the former number one player and moves him into the third round. That's all for your sports news today. Back to you, Steph. Thanks, Dave. And coming up, Ukrainian troops are training in Britain. They're learning to operate multiple launch rocket systems, which the British government is supplying to help counter Russian artillery. And the sole surviving perpetrator of the 2015 Paris terrorist strike received a life sentence in prison on Wednesday. After six years of waiting, the verdict came as a relief for the victim's relatives. Find out more in just a moment here on NTD News. At The Nation Speaks, we don't just scratch the surface. We want to go wide and deep. Our viewers come away with a much richer understanding of the issues of the day. We really make a big effort to bring on different voices onto the show. We don't just talk to experts and newsmakers, which of course are extremely important, but we also want to hear from the American people. So the people who are impacted by the policies and issues that we're talking about, because what they have to say is just as important to the national conversation. President Biden today promised another $800 million in military aid to Ukraine. This is while he says American drivers must pay more for gas for as long as it takes to end the war in Ukraine. Here are the details. Speaking after a NATO summit in Madrid, Spain on Thursday, President Biden said the U.S. plans to send another $800 million in security aid to Ukraine. It would cover advanced air defense systems, counter-battery radars, artillery, and ammunition for high-mobility artillery rocket systems. The United States is rallying the world to stand with Ukraine. Allies and partners around the globe are making significant contributions. During the press conference, a reporter asked Biden about soaring gas prices in the U.S. The war has pushed prices up. They could go as high as $200 a barrel, some analysts think. How long is it fair to expect American drivers and drivers around the world to pay that premium for this war? As long as it takes. So Russia cannot, in fact, defeat Ukraine and move beyond Ukraine. This is a critical, critical position for the world. Congress has approved around $40 billion in military, economic and humanitarian aid for Ukraine since the war began. Biden says he will formally announce the latest $800 million in the coming days. The U.S. is boosting its military presence in Europe based on threats coming from Russia. Biden confirmed the U.S. will raise the number of destroyers in Spain to six from four and said Washington will send two additional F-35 squadrons to Britain and establish the 5th Army headquarters in Poland. And Britain will provide an additional one billion pounds in military aid for Ukraine a near doubling of its support for the war effort against Russia. Alongside this, the country's Prime Minister has committed to increasing the UK's defence spending to 2.5% of GDP by the end of the decade. This report comes from NTD's Malcolm Hudson. Prime Minister Boris Johnson has pledged £55 billion in defence spending over the rest of the decade in response to the threat posed by Russia. It comes as Britain promised £1 billion to Ukraine in addition to a previous £1.3 billion already given in military aid. 
Johnson pledged the funding on Thursday after public lobbying from cabinet ministers Ben Wallace and Liz Truss. Speaking from the NATO summit in Madrid, Truss explained how the UK is helping Ukraine. As well as the immediate supply of the weapons to help them win the war, we're also working with Ukraine on reconstruction, on developing their economy, on bringing investment into Ukraine so they are able to earn the money they need to to run their country uh, as well as fighting this appalling war with Russia. Truss said that they've been working on getting grain out of Odessa so that Ukraine can economically benefit from exports. The promise of extra military support comes after Ukraine's president, Volodymyr Zelensky, urged NATO leaders to do more to help his country. Zelensky told leaders the cost of defence was just over £4 billion per month. The new British aid will go towards equipment such as sophisticated air defence systems, drones and electronic warfare equipment. British officials said the equipment represents the first step in enabling Ukraine to go beyond defence and carry out offensive operations against Russian ground forces to recover lost territory. The £1 billion is set to come from departmental underspends, that is, spare finances from departments that spent less than expected. Defence Secretary Ben Wallace is said to be grateful for the £55 billion, but Tobias Elwood, the Tory chairman of the Commons Defence Committee, said 2.5% of GDP is too little too late. Elwood has called for 3% of GDP to be spent on defence and said that now is not the time to cut the army by 10,000, a sentiment echoed by the Shadow Defence Minister. Malcolm Hudson, NTD News London. And hundreds of Ukrainian troops have completed military training in Britain. That includes training on the Multiple Launch Rocket Systems, or MLRS. The British government is supplying these weapons to help counter Russian artillery tactics. Hundreds of Ukrainian soldiers have received military training in the UK. More than 450 troops were taught how to use a range of weapons by the British Army, including the Multiple Launch Rocket Systems, which Britain is supplying to Ukraine. Media were invited to Salisbury Plain in southern England, where the exercises were taking place. The training is part of a wide-ranging international support package. Following Russia's invasion, Captain James Oliphant of the Royal Artillery was involved in the three-week-long training of the MLRS. At the end of the day, it's, it's another component to their, um, their, their orbit, and it's a force multiplier. Um, because it's a track vehicle, their rocket systems are wheeled. It's going to give them more, more mobility, which is going to aid in their survivability. Uh, and naturally, it's uh, uh, an ammunition that's able to punch out to 84 kilometers. During a surprise visit to Kyiv this month, Prime Minister Boris Johnson announced a separate training operation for Ukrainian forces, with the potential to train up to 10,000 soldiers every 120 days. And on Wednesday, the British government announced it will provide another $1.2 billion of military support to Ukraine, including air defence systems, uncrewed aerial vehicles and new electronic warfare equipment. Meanwhile, back on Salisbury Plain, British trainers praised the attitude of their Ukrainian counterparts. They are extremely keen to learn um, and we have had, had them for long days. Um, we've been teaching them from 8 in the morning till 6 at night, 7 days a week for, for the whole period that they've been here. Um, their, their appetite at the beginning was, as you can imagine, extremely high and very needy. Um, but as they have become more, more attuned and accustomed to the, um, being able to operate this system, that's, that started to calm down. And they're now in a position where the battery commander himself is, is now exercising his troops under his own doctrine and tactics. And in Paris, more than six years after the 2015 Bataclan terrorist attack, perpetrators finally received their verdict from a Paris court. The sole remaining attacker, still alive, received the maximum sentence. The verdict was welcomed by victims of the attack and their relatives. NTD's France correspondent David Vivas has the details. Victims and relatives of the French people who died during the Paris 2015 attack have waited years for this verdict. Perpetrators of the terrorist strike in November 2015 received their verdict on Wednesday at a Paris court. Islamic terrorists attacked different locations in Paris, the Bataclan Music Hall, six bars and restaurants, and the Stade de France Sports Stadium. They opened fire and killed 130 people in a night of carnage across the capital. Salah Abdeslam was the only perpetrator still alive from the attack. 
he was found guilty on terrorism and murder charges, with no possibility of early release, the most severe criminal sentence possible in France. Victims and relatives said they were satisfied by the court's verdict. I am convinced that this most severe sentence will satisfy the expectations of a certain number of our members, a certain number of victims. I am extremely satisfied about the sentences given. I think they are really at the level of what the state should do to protect itself from these types of individuals. It's a very clear message addressed to all people who are tempted by the experience of radical Islam. Another survivor, Arthur de Nouveau, said he has been waiting for this day ever since the attack. Uh, I just feel like I'm here, like I've heard something very important, but I'm not sure what to make of it. So I'm, I'm going to take the time to sit back, relax somehow, and, and, and then see how I feel. Main suspect Abdeslam had said at the start of the trial that he was a soldier of the Islamic State which has claimed responsibility for the attacks. Beside Abd al-Slam, 19 other men were tried for helping organize the attacks. The judge said all defendants were found guilty on all counts, with the exception of terrorism charges for one of the less prominent accused. It has been a trial like no others, not only for its exceptional length of 10 months, but also for the time that was devoted to allow victims to testify in detail about their ordeal and their struggles in overcoming it. While families of those killed spoke of how hard it was to move on. Though this verdict brings some relief for victims, France still faces the serious threat of terrorist attacks, according to the Interior Ministry. Several other terrorist attacks have occurred since 2015. Moreover, it not only comes from known terrorist networks such as Al-Qaeda or ISIS, but also from isolated individuals, such as in the beheading of a teacher in 2021. Some experts now talk about what they call an environment of radicalism, meaning the terrorist threat can come from anywhere among radicalized groups in society, rather than from terrorist circles already monitored by authorities. David Vives, NTD News, Paris. Up next, Riverside Park in Manhattan is coming up with a creative solution to get rid of the invasive weeds in the park, and it involves goats. Find out more after this short break. Secure, the true solution for your digital privacy and security. Secure is a private and secure messaging and email solution hosted in Switzerland using military-grade encryption and Swiss privacy laws, giving you true privacy. Secure is 100% private and does not collect or sell any of your personal data. Secure's Helix technology connects you securely to our Swiss servers without the need of a VPN, guaranteeing privacy and security for all your communications. Secure Messenger doesn't require your phone number or any personal data that hackers target. Chat by Invites allows you to chat privately and securely with anyone outside of your secure network without the need for others to download Secure. Secure Send offers you a private and secure way to email anyone outside of Secure. You won't find this level of privacy or security on any other email or instant messaging application. Visit secure.com. Regain and protect your privacy today. This summer, you will be able to see wildlife at Riverside Park in Manhattan. 20 goats have come from a farm in upstate New York to remove the invasive weed species at the park. It's a win-win situation for both the park and the goats. Here are the details. 20 goats from Green Goats Farm in Rhinebeck, New York, journeyed to Riverside Park in Manhattan to munch on invasive weeds. They're in here to eat invasive, a lot of poison ivy, that sort of thing. Poison ivy, um, a lot of people are allergic to. Um, and, and also, also it's, it's a little hilly and machines don't work as well. Um, the goats are great. And they're the, probably the only animal that don't poop out fertilized pellets. It's a win-win situation for both the goats and the park. The goats have a natural hunger for leafy greens and the park doesn't have to send workers to areas that are hard to access. They also don't need to dump harsh chemicals on weeds and poison ivy. Well, have you looked at the slope? It's very steep. 
Uh, plus the trees, you've got you've got tree roots and such. You don't want to just destroy the trees, uh, and it's it's and it's just hard to access. Um, it's very hard to access to to try to come in there and pull this stuff by hand. Some New Yorkers are visiting the park just to see the goats, which are a rare sight in Manhattan. It's great to see them, you know, nibbling the weeds and taking care of the park, and it's a nice sort of whole circle thing. They get what they need, and the park gets what they need, and everybody can come enjoy them. Just like the running of the bulls, we wanted to see them come out of the gate fast, which they did. Um, they were a lot bigger than we thought, so that was really fun. And yeah, they just started working right away, so it's really fun to see wildlife like this in Riverside Park. Four of the 20 goats will stay at the park through the end of summer, eating their way through two acres of the park. And that's all for today's news. Thanks for tuning in. I'm Stephanie Cox. Thanks for watching us on YouTube. Did you know YouTube only keeps selective videos on its platform? So if you want to make sure you get the full picture, just subscribe to our newsletter. Go to newsletter.ntd.com and sign up. It's free.